and I want to welcome you once more to another edition of our Bible studies. You know, we have been uh, carefully going through the book of the epistles to, of John to the churches, and we are in 1 John. I said we are carefully going through because we have not been able to move at a fast pace because we are trying to get as much as we can out of this passage. So last week we, we, we were at chapter 4 and verse 2. We stopped at chapter 4 and verse 2, which is 1 John chapter 4, verse 2. So this week we are going to pick up with verse 3, chapter 4, and verse 3. So that's sent first John, sorry, first John chapter four, verse three, and we will see how far we can go, how much of, um, of this passage we can cover this evening within the time that we, we have. So I'm going to ask somebody please to read verse three. Could start with you, Sister Wallace, and then we go across. Um, verse three. First John chapter four and verse verse three. First John four and verse three. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of the hand Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come. And even now, already, it is in the world. Thank you, Sister Wallace. So we want to back up and look at where we left off last week, a chapter, uh, sorry, at verse, verse 2. So verse 2 said, Hereby he know, sorry, hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth, that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Amen? So that's where we ended last week. That every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And we would know um, the background um, of this by now that um, would have occasioned John's writing, that the fall, there were false teachers in the churches that were teaching another gospel, saying that Jesus did not come in the flesh and that Jesus was not the Christ. In fact, he was not the, the Messiah, right? You remember those two words we used last week? Messiah and Christ. So we are, and we said that the Messiah was Jesus in the Old Testament. That's how Jesus was referred to in the Old Testament as the Messiah. And in the New Testament, he is referred to as the Christ. And so when we say Jesus Christ, we are acknowledging that Jesus is truly the Messiah. And so there were false teachers in the churches who were refusing to, to credit the title Christ to Jesus. And so the, John is saying that that's how you know that there are false teachers. If any man, if you refer to him just as Jesus and not Jesus Christ. So that's one of the tests to know the false teachers that John, they used in the early church. You say, so if you, if you acknowledged Jesus as the Christ, and if you acknowledged that he came in the flesh, then you could pass the test to be an authentic preacher of the gospel. Good? So one merely confesses him as man. Those false teachers merely confess him as man. Possibly a miracle worker, 
or prophet, while the other confesses him as the Son of God and the Savior of the world. And that would be the authentic preacher, um, confessing Christ as the Savior of the world and as the Son of God. So there are religions that believe in Jesus, but they do not believe that Jesus is the Christ and that he came in human flesh. So it says, and this is that spirit of, of Antichrist, yes? And this is that spirit of what? Of Antichrist. Great. And so, any false prophet who denies that Jesus is the Christ and he had come in human flesh is under the subjection of the spirit of Antichrist. Great. So any prophet at all who, or any man who claim to be a prophet, but he, he of course denies that Jesus is the Christ and that he had come in the human flesh is under the subjection of the spirit of Antichrist. Yes, he's not working by the Holy Spirit, but by the spirit of the Antichrist. And that's what the Bible says. It says that a person who fails to confess that Jesus is the Christ and that he came in human flesh is under the spirit of the Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist will be released unhindered unto the first field of tribulation. But already the spirit of the Antichrist is at work, though it is hindered by the Holy Spirit. But yes, the spirit of the Antichrist is already at work. So it says, wherefore he have heard that it should come. Now, this is a future reference to the release spirit of the Antichrist during the tribulation. However, the spirit is already present at work in the world today. But the, the current work of the Antichrist in many false prophets is but the foreshadowing of the coming of the Antichrist and his ultimate false prophet. Thus, the Christian must expect a life of spiritual battles now and not merely expecting such testing to be confined to the future tribulation alone. And so what we're saying is that the, the, although the Antichrist himself is not here as yet, hmm? but there are prophets who are carrying out, who are already carrying out his work here on earth. And so the child of God, the believers, should expect spiritual battles in this life. We are going to be faced with spiritual battles because there are spirits, there are forces that are working against Christ. The Antichrist spirit is already at work in the world, yes? Trying to hinder what the believer is doing, the work that you're carrying out for Christ. And that's why we are faced with so many spiritual battles. Amen, brothers and sisters? Yes, and these battles will continue until Jesus Christ raptures the church. Amen? So you must be expecting a life of spiritual battles now. You are going to be tested, yes? You are going to be tried, yes? The church is going to have problems. Yes, we will have problems, yes? And why is the church going to have problems? Because they come into the church as wolves in sheep clothing. Good. So they look like Christians. They sound like Christians. They talk like Christians. They walk 
like Christians. They even dress like Christians. But they don't believe in Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world. And the big problem is they are inside the church. So that's where the church has a big problem. That these prophets, so-called prophets who are driven by the spirit of the Antichrist are in the church around the pulpits. Praise God. Hmm? So those without the church are not much problem for the church. Not really. Because you already know that they are the enemy of the church. Hmm? So a man who comes up and profess that, you know, already he's a sorcerer and he's a this and he's a that. You already know that you will battle with that person. But the one who is dressed like a Christian, the one who is behaving like a Christian, the one who sounds like a Christian, that's where the real battle is, believers. Because you don't truly know that that is your enemy. So the big problem is those churches that are, that are teaching false doctrines. Yes? That is already a spirit of Antichrist. And it is already in many churches. There are many churches that are teaching false doctrines. And that is the real problem that the true church is faced with today. Because you have them springing up all over the place. Yes? Professing to be the authentic church. But when you check it out, they are driven and empowered by the spirit of the, the Antichrist. Praise God. Praise the Lord. So let's do verse 4. Verse 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Thank you, Sister Thompson. Great. So believers are set in strong contrast to the Antichrist. Believers are from God and they have overcome. How many of you have overcome? Yeah, nobody, few. How many of you have overcome? You are an overcomer. Praise the Lord. You must not be afraid to testify that you are an overcomer. Because if you are in Christ, you are already an overcomer. Yes? And so believers are from God and they have overcome. This short letter uses the word overcome six times, which is more than any other New Testament book besides Revelation. John does place a great emphasis upon victory in the Christian life. Praise God that the church a victory. Yes, John places a lot of emphasis on victory in the Christian life, the Christian's life. The Christian must experience victory. Praise God. Yes, as John has consistently maintained, you have spiritual strength and are capable of successfully resisting the Antichrist, meaning the people and the, thing, and the things that are not of Christ. Let's unpack that. So John has consistently maintained that the believer has enough strength from God and that the believer is capable of successfully resisting the Antichrist. So John was saying to them here in verse 4 that you are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Them who? 
the Antichrist. Why? Because greater is he that is in you and he that is in the world. So I want the church to understand that whatever comes up before you, whatever temptation you face, whatever it is that the enemy has brought before you does not have to stumble you. You have enough strength, praise God, to resist the things of the Antichrist, the power of the Antichrist, and even the Antichrist himself. Yes? And so the reason for your victory lies in the possession of the Holy Spirit. For this reason, John is very confident that the Holy Spirit will enable us to resist the attempt, encouragement of the false prophets and antichrist. Yes, John is confident that you are able to resist, to resist the attempted encouragement of the false prophets and the antichrist. So whatever the false prophets come with and the antichrist come with to lure you away from Christ. John is saying you, are, you have enough strength within you. You have the Holy Spirit within you which who will enable you to resist the pull of the false prophets and the Antichrist. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, somebody. Amen. So that Holy Spirit is the same Holy Spirit that will help you, like we said last week, to detect the false prophet, to, 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 to put the false prophet to the test and to ascertain that whether he is false or he is authentic. And when you have ascertained that he is false, that same Holy Spirit, according to this week's lesson, is able to give you the power, praise the Lord, the power to resist the attempted encouragement of such false prophets. Why? Because greater is the Holy Spirit that is in you, praise the Lord, than the spirit of the Antichrist that is in the world. Amen? So the Holy Spirit is in you and the spirit of the Antichrist is in the world. But your spirit is greater. The Holy Spirit in you is greater, is stronger, and is more powerful and is able to overcome the spirit of the Antichrist that is in the world. And the spirit of the Antichrist is what drives every pursuit that is against Christ. Amen? Yes, so whatever is against Christ, whatever is not driven by the Holy Spirit is driven by the Spirit of the Antichrist. Yes? So all those establishments and those businesses and that are set up that are not of God. Yes? We're talking about the, the gambling industries, the gaming and betting and the lottery. Those are driven by the spirit of the Antichrist because they are not of God. Talking about the pornographic industry. Yes, we're talking about the alcohol and tobacco industry. Those spirits that want to tempt you to consume alcohol, 
drugs and smoke and to, 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 to buy lotto and pick three and you know them, tell me them. And what? You don't know them? Pick four and pick five. <laughs> Cash pot. Yes? And all of those that are driven by the spirit of the Antichrist. What John is saying is that you have a spirit within you as the child of God that is more powerful than the spirit that is pulling you to buy lotto. You have a spirit within you which is more powerful than the spirit that wants to pull you into whatever is unbecoming and whatever is not of God. In other words, what John is saying is that you have the spirit within you which will enable you to be an overcomer, will help you to overcome the temptations of the world. Amen? Praise God. Let's go to verse 5. Verse 5, they are of the world, therefore speak of the world, and the world heard, heard them. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Matthews. Yes. So whereas the Christian's source of power is God, the false prophets draw upon the world's power. That is the power of Satan for his word and his speech and his actions. He is driven by the spirit of the world, the spirit of Satan. Down through the ages, false doctrines have far greater appeal to worldly people than does the orthodox doctrine. Many false religions and false religious movements are composed mainly of unsaved people who find false theology an attractive movement. They are of the world, John says, and the world hear them. So right down the ages, false doctrines, yes, have had far greater appeal to worldly people. And you'd wonder how some of these churches that are springing up around us, how they expand so rapidly. Yes? Some of these mega churches that you see around us, check out the doctrines and see if the doctrines are sound. Test the doctrines. And see if the doctrines are not faulty. Because people find it easier to gravitate to false doctrines than to the real, true, authentic doctrine of God. Go out there and set up a church if you don't believe me. And start to preach that it's okay to fornicate. And see how quickly you have a mega church. Go there and set up a church and start to preach that, well, Jesus is not the only way to heaven. And see how quickly you have a mega church. Go out there and set up a church and start to tell the people that they don't have to live a holy life. And see how quickly you have a mega church. Yes? And so... Very often, when you see these mega churches spring up, they are fueled by false teachings and false doctrines. Amen? Because they are of the world, and the world do what? The world does what? The world hear them. The world will listen to them because they are speaking the doctrines, they are speaking the language of the world. But when you go, when we go there and we start preach and tell them to leave sin, stop fornicating, 
leave homosexuality, come out of gambling, huh? come out of concubinage. They don't want to hear that. They don't, the world don't, doesn't want to hear that. And that is why it's so difficult for us to have a mega church. I know a little preach we preach. I know a little prayer we pray. I know a little evangelism um, efforts we, we, and initiatives we go on. No, it's a whole lot. But the world is not going to hear us easily or quickly, deacon. Because we are not of the world and we are not speaking the language of the world. Amen, somebody? Amen. Praise God. So, yes, John says, they are of the world. And the world will listen to them. The world will hear what they say. Yes, the world will obey what they say. The world will gravitate to them. Let's read verse 6. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Hallelujah. Thank you, Sister Wright. So we are from God. And the we here is a reference to the apostles. Yes? He that knows God hears us, John says. The apostles have proven emphatically through signs and word that they were indeed from God. We know the apostles were from God because the miracles verified that. The many miracles that were wrought through them. Therefore, we can know that with their claims substantiated, everyone who desires to know God's word and his commandments would listen to them. So when the, the thing is that when you when people identify a real prophet, an authentic prophet, they will listen to them. You get me, somebody? If, if people develop that kind of a confidence in you as a man of God, they will listen to you. And that is why it's so important that as leaders, as spiritual leaders, we be very careful of how we operate, what we say, what we do. Because you see, when people believe in you, John is saying, they will listen to you. They will hear you. I don't know if you, those of you who have children at home, little children, if you have ever, ever tried to help your little child to do their homework. Listen to me. If you ever say anything that teacher did not say, you are in trouble because you cannot assist with that homework. Even if you yourself are a teacher, they are as principal as you are. If you are not saying what teacher said and doing it the way that teacher does it, they will not hear you. They will not listen to what you are saying. Yes? And that is a kind of power and influence that a spiritual leader has. And so John is saying to the church, listen, you would have tested us and you can substantiate that we are of God because you've seen the miracles. Yes, you have heard the words that we have preached to you and have taught to you so you know that we are from God and so you can listen to us. 
Yes? You can listen to us. Therefore, we can know that with their claims substantiated, everyone who desires to know God's word and his commandments would listen, would listen to them. Now, he that is not of God hears us not. He that is not of God, he says, does not listen to us. In this context, not of God signals anyone out of touch with God. And this could either be a believer or an unbeliever. Because remember now John is writing to the church. So John is saying, the believer in the church who is not of God, but is a hypocrite, will not listen to us. They won't obey us. Yes? And so when you preach and you teach, and people to whom you teach and preach go away and do contrary to the preaching and to the teaching, then you know they're not of God. Not of God. Not of God. Because there are, there are people within the church, and when I say the church, I'm not necessarily speaking of this local assembly. I mean the church in general. There are people who are a part of the church and they will never listen to their leaders. Although their leaders have been proven to be of God, anointed and sent by God, they're still not listening because their leader is not saying what they want to hear. They are still bent and doing their own thing and going their own way. Pastor can turn the talk. Deacon can say what he wants to say. Uh, I know what I know and I'm doing it my way. So John says, you know that such a person is not of God. For he that is not of God hears us not. Hereby we know, hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. It is by submission to the apostles' authority. It is by submission to the apostles' authority that, that orthodox or accepted or traditional Christian doctrine is recognized. And let me say it again. It's by submission to the apostles' authority. And what's the apostles' authority? Of God. Yes? So it is by submission to the apostles' authority, which comes directly from God, that traditional Christian doctrine is recognized. My pastor told me a story some years ago of a discussion that was going on in, in a particular church. They were discussing speaking in tongues and what, you know, what should happen in a church where speaking in tongues is concerned in, with regards to the order, you know, where, and so the there's a gentleman in the church who was saying, it is all right for everybody to just run up and down and speak in tongues and so forth. So the pastor was teaching that the Bible says that it is two or three the most, something like that, and, and they should do it in turns. So the pastor said, see it here? It's Paul, see Paul say it here in the Bible? The gentleman looked at the pastor and said, listen, Paul don't know what I'm saying. Paul, no, no. Why am I saying? Praise the Lord. And so, I'm saying that there are those who will not listen or obey the authority 
of the apostle. But it is when you obey the authority of the apostle, knowing that the apostle's authority is of God, comes from God. And that is when you will know that a person is a true Christian, a true believer. Amen? Praise God. Let's run to verse 7 now. Verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is, a, love is of God. Everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Amen. Praise God. Now it can be easily seen from the epistle on a whole that John has given two equal and inseparable qualities of the Christian who reveals his fellowship with God. And what are the two inseparable qualities of the Christian who reveals his fellowship with God? One, the fellowshipping Christian keeps God's commandments. And we saw that in the first two chapters. And two, we are now seeing from verse 7 that the fellowshipping Christian loves his fellow Christians. So one, he keeps God's commandments. And two, he loves his fellow Christians. And that reveals his fellowship with God. And you will remember the words revealing and concealing. You remember that? That we can either reveal our fellowship with God or we can conceal it. Yes? When we keep God's commandments, we are, in fact, revealing our fellowship with God. When we fail to keep God's commandments, we are concealing our fellowship with God. And here now John is saying, when we love our one another, we are also revealing our fellowship with God. So when you don't love your fellow Christians, when you don't keep God's commandments, you conceal that you are a Christian. But when you keep God's commandments and you love your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, then you are revealing that you have a close abiding and fellowshipping relationship with God. And so the Christian that wants to reveal his fellowship keeps God's commandments and loves his fellow Christians. Now with this verse, John lays behind the section about spiritual warfare. But when we come to verse 7, it might be seen as an abrupt change of subject, but if read closely, the coherence of the section can be seen. And in fact, with this verse, John is returning to the theme of God abiding in us, which he started over in chapter 3. So he had paused to deal with spiritual warfare you know, warring with the Antichrist. And then here now he is returning to the, the subject, yes, or the theme of God abiding in us. So having warned his readers about spiritual warfare, John now stresses the genuine mark of the Holy Spirit's activity, the expression of Christian love. Let me say that again. Having warned his readers about spiritual warfare, John now stresses the genuine mark of the Holy Spirit's activity, praise God, in the life of the believer, which is the expression of Christian love. So John here is saying that the expression of Christian love is the mark of the Holy Spirit's activity in the life of the Christian. In other words, the Holy Spirit enables the Christian to love. The work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Christian is to enable the Christian to, to love. You remember that little song we sing, um, Goodbye World? 
It's the Holy Ghost and, and fire. It's the Holy Ghost and fire. Makes me love everybody. You, you, you remember that little song? Good. And, and we were wondering what the songwriter was singing. The Holy Ghost. It's artists, or some people sing it. It's the Holy Ghost, my brother. He makes me love everybody. Goodbye world, goodbye world, I am gone. <laughs> Amen. So, and we were wondering what the, whole, what the songwriter meant when he said that. It's the Holy Ghost and he makes me love everybody. So here now John is saying that's really the work that the Holy Spirit comes to do in the life of the believer. To make the believer love everybody. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And that is how the believer knows that he is abiding. And that is when the, 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 the baby Christian, the young convert can sing goodbye world. I am gone. Because formerly I did not have the ability to love everybody. I, 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 I could pick and choose who I love. I could determine whether I love this one or I hate that one. But now the baby Christian is singing, goodbye world, I am gone. I no longer operate that way. The way of choosing who I love and who I don't love. But the Holy Ghost and the fire that is in me enables me to love everybody. So goodbye world. I am God. Yes? So now John has just told us in verse 6 that those who listen to false teachers and not to the apostles were not of God. But if the readers carried out the command to love one another, they would be carrying on the activity whose source was God. In other words, the true Christian love whenever... Sorry, in other words, true Christian love, whenever it is expressed, finds its source in God and takes its character from God himself. The source of true Christian love is God. Yes? And it takes its character from God himself. God does not pick and choose who to love. God does not love just those who love him. God loves everybody. Praise God. So when you show Christian love, you are showing and reflecting an activity, an emotion, or a feeling that comes from and has its source in God himself. Because you cannot love without Christ in you. And you cannot love without having the love of God as an example before you. So many times we think of love as being a reciprocal relationship. So I will love you because you love me. But that is not Christian love, brothers and sisters. Christian love is I will love you no matter how you treat me. I will love you no matter how you despise me. I will love you no matter how you love me. I will love you no matter how you feel about me. I will love you no matter who you are. That is real Christian love. And where does that kind of love come from? Hmm? It comes from the Holy Spirit, the Almighty God himself. Jesus said, God committed his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have 
everlasting life. Praise God. And why is this important? Because the Bible says the world despises Christ. The world despises God. And yet God loves the world. You see that church? And so that is the kind of Christian love we must have. A love that is extended to even those who despise us. A love that is extended to even those who hate us. A love that is extended to even those who criticize us. Yes? And speak all manner of evil against us. The love that comes from God. The love that God has for, for the world. Praise God. So it follows then that everyone who loves may have two things safely said about them. They are born of God and they know God. Everyone who truly love, everyone who truly loves, and note I said truly loves, not just love, but truly love, because when you truly love, you know, even those who hate you and can't stand you any at all, you still love them, you know, when you truly love even the co-worker who caused you to lose your job, you still love them, you know. When you truly love even the little microwave girl will take away your husband, you still love her, you know? Yes. When you truly love. And can I say, church, if you truly have the love of God in you, it's not difficult to love them. You find that you don't even have to Force yourself to love them. And I've said it before. It may, it may be the reverse, Sister Wallace. You're, you're trying to force yourself not to love them. And you find that it can't work. You're just loving them and you, don't, you, can't, you can't explain. Why? How are you loving them and you're not supposed to love them? Based on the world's standards. But it's because you truly love and you truly love because of two things, right? One, you are born of God and, and you know God. You're born of God and you know God. Praise the Lord. And that's, in, that's what verse 7 says. Everyone that loveth is born of God and Knoweth God. Praise God. Verse 8. It he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Thank you, Sister Thompson. Now the most the world will ever see Christ is how much they see Christ in us as Christians. The most the world will ever see Christ is how much they see Christ in us as Christians. They are not going to see Christ come down and stand like a man. The world is going to see Christ through us. Therefore, it's important that we live a Christ-like life. And God is love, and therefore... The only way for them to see the love of God and the love of Christ is to see it worked out through us as Christians. It's important that we show love. Now, since the saved man can fail to love, if he does not love, it shows that he has not really come to know God, who is his heavenly father. Yes? And there's a break in communication. There's a break in the relationship somehow, some way. And so we see here a person that does not love 
does not know God in the way he ought to know him. There has been a break in communication. There has been a I know more than God mentality. And it is as you mature and walk in your Christian walk that you begin to say, you know what? My father actually knows what he's talking about. It is as you mature and grow in your Christian life that you understand what God is saying about this love thing. Because if you are outside of Christ, you, 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 you cannot understand it. In fact, you cannot do it outside of Christ. Outside of the ability of the Holy Ghost, outside of the influence of the Holy Spirit, you cannot love somebody who, who hates you. You cannot love somebody who damages your character. You cannot love somebody who tries to throw, push you up, throw you under the bus. Somebody who causes you to lose your job. Outside of Christ, it is impossible to love such a person. Yes? You see the... Oh, you see the, the level of crime we have in this country. The killings. The murders. What do you think causes that? Lack of love. Lack, the lack of love in the hearts of men and women who are outside of Christ. Just the other day, one sister orchestrated the death of her own sister. What caused that? Not love. It's the lack of love in the hearts of people who are outside of Christ. It is the Cain spirit that we spoke about some weeks back. That cannot, cannot stand, cannot bear to see your fellow brother and your fellow sister progress in life. That spirit of hate, that spirit of murder. Yes, that has possessed the hearts of men and women outside of Christ. I'm saying, brothers and sisters, that outside of Christ, it is impossible to love. Yes? To demonstrate the love of God. Praise God. And so we see here a person that does not love, does not know God in the way he ought to know him. There has been a break in communication. And so he actually does not know God in the way he ought to. Now here we come to the second of John's two affirmations about God. The first one was in chapter 1. Verse 5, which stated that God is light. And here John states now that God is love. So the first, God is light, points to God's perfect holiness, his freedom from all sin. And here John declares uh, another sublime aspect of God's nature, which is characterized by love. Now this does not mean that God does not have it any other attributes such as wisdom and justice but it does indicate that love is a fundamental aspect of who God is and of what he does God is love but God will still allow man to go to hell God is love but God will still judge people at the judgment seat of God and at the judgment seat of Christ God is love but God is so much more than that as well. Yes? So it is so important that God is love. Can you imagine a God without love? Where would you be? Where would I be? 
with a God without love. Praise God. It was the love of God that allowed Jesus Christ to go to Calvary's cross and to take our place and to bear our sins so we may have the opportunity to go to heaven. God did that because he loves us. So without God being loved, there is no hope of salvation. It is very important that God is love. Now as a quick offside, it must be noted that God is a simple being. And what do I mean by that? God is a simple being. He is not part anything. For example, he is not partly just or partly holy. He is completely just and completely holy. And as such, he displays these attributes completely. So God God is not a simple being. He is a complete being. He does everything completely. So that means he does not display justice towards some and not toward others. And can you imagine if God did that? And it, that works the same way with his holiness and with everything else. So God does not love some men and don't love others. He loves everybody. He loves everybody. Please find 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9 and let us read that. 2 Peter 3 verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. See? Thank you, Sister Wallace. So God's love is complete and whole. And this love is displayed to all men. Not willing that any should perish. So some people might ask, how can a God who claims to be love ever send anyone to hell? Because some people say that. In fact, there is a, there, there, there's a religious group that teaches that God will not make his good, good people and turn around and burn them up. Yes? But the scripture is clearly indicating God's love for the whole world. For God so loved the world. So the scripture points out, points out all of that. If a man in sin rejects the love of God and goes to hell, it's not what God wishes, but it is what God will allow because of his wisdom and his justice. Let's look at 1 Timothy 2. 1 Timothy 2, verse 3. 1 Timothy chapter 2, read verse 3 and up to 6. Yes. First Timothy chapter 2, 3. For this is good... And acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Verse 6, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Praise God. Thank you, Sister Wright. So God wanted all men to be saved. Yes, that is God's wish that all men would be saved. He will have all men to be saved, but he allows people to reject his love and his wisdom. Why? Because he has created everybody with a with a will. Yes? And we say the will, what's the will? The ability to choose. Yes, 
God has created us with a will. We are not created as robots. Something that you just wind up and wind up and let it go. And then it, it operates based on how you program it. No, we are not programmed. God did not program us to serve him. He gave us the choice whether we want to serve him or not. But there's a consequence. Yes? There's a consequence for that choice. Yes? Choose God and live. Reject him and die. Choose God and go to an eternal heaven. Reject him and go to an eternal hell. So God did not send anybody into hell. You choose. The choice you make will determine your eternal destiny. Yes, you choose to serve God, then you're, you're choosing heaven as your eternal destiny. You choose to reject God, then you're choosing hell as your eternal destiny. Amen? Praise God. And so this is why the love of fellow Christians is not automatic either. It's not automatic. But God by his spirit enables us to love one another, but does not compel us to love one another. Yes? God will not force us to love one another. Yes? He enables us. Praise the Lord. Yes, he enables us through his Holy Spirit to love our brothers and our sisters. Praise the Lord. So God does not make you love me. God does not make me love you. But with the Holy Spirit in both of us, it allows us to have the opportunity and the power to do what God has commanded. And that is to love one another. Praise the Lord. Because you don't have to do what God says, you know. How many of you knew that? You know, you don't ever have to do what God says you are to do. He tells you to do it. And he provides the, the power, the enablement. For you to do what he commands you to do. But you don't have to do it. Praise the Lord. But know that when you disobey, there's a consequence. Just like when you obey, there is uh, a reward. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, church. So even when you come to church and the Holy Spirit tells you to shout, you don't have to shout. Hmm? You can choose. And the Holy Spirit comes upon you and tells you to run around the church and run through the aisle. You don't have to do it. You have a choice. Because God is not going to hold anybody at gunpoint. But no, there are rewards and consequences based on the choice you make. Praise God. So we could not do, we could not love without the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, we would fall short of what God would have us to do. But God gave us all that we need when he gave us the Holy Spirit to be able to love one another. So we can love one another through the enablement of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at the last verse, verse 9. Verse 9, in this was manifest the love of God towards us because God sent his only begotten son into the world that he, may, he might live through him. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Matthews. As a Christian reveals his love for God by loving his fellow Christians with a divine love, so too does God reveal his love toward the Christian through the cross of Calvary. So John is reminding his readers of the supreme expression of the love of Almighty God, which fully justifies the claim he just made that God is love. 
John says, God is love. And the question comes from the audience. audience. How do you know? Prove it. And John says, the love of God was shown toward us. It was manifested toward us. And how? Because God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And that's what John says. Now John is justifying the claim that he just made. But what can possibly make this fundamental truth about God's nature more evident than the fact that God had sent his only begotten son into the world for our salvation? For what? For our salvation. Praise God. He came for our salvation. Salvation. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And so John is saying if God did that for us, then through the Holy Spirit, we should be willing to love our neighbor as ourselves. We should be willing to love our brothers and our sisters through the enablement of of the Holy Spirit because we are reflecting the God that is in us. When we walk on the street, we are reflecting the God that is in our hearts. When we are at home, we are reflecting the God that is in our hearts. When we come to church and as we interact with our friends and our neighbors and even our enemies, we are reflecting the God that is in our hearts. We are reflecting the truth of God that we are born of God. Amen? We are born of God and we know, we know God. Praise God. And so when you go on the road, And you're driving, brother cross, if you're driving for a while behind another vehicle, you can tell, officer, if that driver knows the road code or he doesn't know the road code. Because you have some drivers out there that don't know the road code. And you have to be very careful how you drive behind them because they will cause you to crash. The point I'm making, brothers and sisters, is that you know God. So you must drive good. You know the road code. When you are born of God and you know God, it means that you know the road code. Praise the Lord. The spiritual road code I'm talking about. And so you can be a guide to those who are behind you. You ought to be a guide to those who are searching for the way. Those who want to find Jesus. Those who want to know how to live and how to operate. Can watch you and follow you. Because you are of God. And you know God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So hereby we know that we are of God when we love one another. And the world is watching us. Because what they will know of Christ is what they see in us. We are Christ representatives. We are his ambassadors in this world. And we are to pull the world to God. God bless you. God bless you richly. Thank you very much. Praise God. Greetings, brothers and sisters. Thank you for joining us as we continue to study the word of God in this, our weekly Bible studies. 
We do hope that you find this study in our series of the Epistles of John enlightening and inspiring. I invite you to join us as well for our Sunday morning worship service. Currently, we host three services on a Sunday morning. The first begins at 7 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. The second service is at 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. And the third and final service is at 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook as well. Please like, share, and leave a comment. God bless you and thanks again for joining.